Well, hello, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to the fifth and final um, emotional sobriety workshop. It was only going to be one. So there you go. We, <laughs> we got a bunch of them. And um, all of them have been recorded and all of them will be available. Uh, I'm playing a moderator today because our usual very professional host is going to be our uh, lead today, uh, John R. So uh, I'm uh, uh, someone had to do uh, his duties and I'm going to fumble through them. Uh, let's see here. So John's going to be speaking on interpersonal relationships, a pathway of emotional sobriety for about 30 minutes. The panel will make some comments and have some brief discussion for 20 minutes. We'll have a five minute break. Uh, we'll open discussion to anyone who'd like to raise their hand for brief comments for about an hour. Uh, because of the size of the meeting, we ask you to keep your comments to a couple of minutes. Uh, Kat is our timekeeper. She'll uh, let you know when your two minutes have expired and then try to land that plane. Uh, please note the meeting audio is being recorded for a future posting on the um, uh, Living Sober, uh, Free Thinkers Living Sober uh, website. Our panelists include New York best time, New York Times bestselling author, Maria Hornbacker. Uh, she's a journalist, a poet, a teacher, been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, Books include Waiting, Non-Believers, Higher Power, Wasted, a Memoir of Anorexia and Bulimia, uh, Sane, Mental Illness, Addiction, and the 12 Steps. Uh, and uh, all of us here are big Waiting fans. If you haven't read it, it still has that new book smell and uh, very contemporary. Dr. Alan Berger, he's got a lot of books too, and he's got a brand new one coming out. He's known for 12 smart things to do when booze and drugs are gone. Um, his latest book is just coming out. I'm very excited. 12 Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety on this very topic, uh, Getting Your Recovery Unstuck. Hopefully he'll talk about that a little bit. And he's spent the last several years writing, focusing, and presenting seminars on the subject of emotional sobriety. Um, we're uh, thrilled to have him and uh, certainly recommend uh, a whole slew of his uh, books and videos. And uh, me, uh, I wrote a daily reflection book on... Uh, uh, 12-step life that was secular because I couldn't find one. Otherwise, I would have just bought it. I'm a, more of a reader than a writer, uh, but uh, I have written a few uh, songs and books and blogs and uh, magazine articles too. And a little bit, uh, and John, you'll hear more about John later. Uh, housekeeping, our uh, timekeeper is uh, Kat. Mark S. is our tech support. Uh, and, um, uh, and thank you to them and thank you to everybody who's here. It's uh, great to have you. This workshop has a chat function for discussion. Uh, depending on uh, the type of instrument you're on, if you are on a PC or a Mac, uh, down below uh, there will be a little reaction tab. If you click on that, it's got a raise hand feature if you're new uh, to this uh, format. Uh, if you have any trouble and you would like to share when we get to the sharing portion, just message me or any of the hosts and we'll uh, get you in the queue. Um, keep anonymity in mind if that's important to you. This is being recorded. Uh, the, so the audio will be out there. Uh, because there are a lot of attendees, we'll try to get as many questions in as we can. Uh, we might not be able to get to them all. Let's see. And now, ladies and gentlemen, are uh, uh, the original host and uh, today's uh, closeout speaker, John.
Okay, my name is John R. I am an average alcoholic and a, and a fill in the blank. Happy to be dealt in for another hand today. Uh, my sobriety date is April 1st, 1981, and my home group is the Free Thinkers Living Sober Group, the Verde Valley, Arizona. Although now it's national and international, so uh, locale is not as big as it used to be. Um, I would like to mention I'm not an expert or an authority on any of this. Uh, all I want to do is is share some of the things that have really kind of inspired and interested and informed me over the years about uh, interpersonal relationships and how they help provide a pathway to uh, for emotional sobriety. And um, I I also want to mention that you know I've had a lot of help from other programs besides AA, Al-Anon, SLAA, ACOA, um, NVC, Nonviolent Communications, which is uh, something I'll, I might mention later on. And uh, so far in these workshops, we've focused primarily on what might be called interpersonal relationships. That is our relationship with and within ourselves. Uh, for some of us, that's multiple selves. Um, these have been important and vital steps toward ongoing emotional sobriety in the course of my sobriety. Um, they've been essential. Uh, you might call them the sine qua non if you're a Latin fan <laughs> of lasting recovery. However, where the where the rubber really meets the road, I think, is in our relationships with those around us. Uh, Maria pointed this out in our last workshop that <clears throat> it may be the best measure for whether we've gone beyond what she was calling the emotional range, um, stepping on the toes of others. Um, not just our most intimate relationships. I don't want to just talk about um, spouses or close friends or sponsors or like that. But even our relationships with with acquaintances or neutral parties can uh, can both benefit and help in emotional sobriety. And finally, there are those with whom we might have negative interactions. Maybe we'd rather not see them at all. <laughs> uh, sometimes they're the most important part of growing into emotional sobriety for me. I I think though overall interpersonal relationships have probably been the most vital aspects um, uh, in experiencing that psychic change that that uh, Carl Jung talked about and it talks about in the big book. Um, in my earliest years of sobriety, I remember uh, <laughs> I would complain about somebody in the rooms or somebody I didn't like or had a problem with and, and my sponsor would tell me to ask him to go to coffee. Uh, or he'd, he'd have me write an inventory, you know, write their inventory. Um, and I had to write it out too. So I went to coffee with a lot of people because uh, I had a problem with a few people when I got sober. The main thing I learned was that most of the time I didn't really know them. You know, um, most of what I knew was my reactions to them. And when I wrote out an inventory, um, I would find sometimes that the that actually it was a past relationship that I was reacting to and not them at all. So um, there's that. I also, have you ever heard that phrase, um, you're just a mirror for me? <laughs> I made the mistake of saying that to my sponsor. And uh, he just looked at me with that look, you know, and he says, you know, certain narcissists, uh, there's a person behind that mirror. <laughs> you might want to try looking beyond your own reflection and try seeing them. Anyway, um, he, he had a way of <laughs> of putting things that kind of put me in my place a lot of times. Anyway, I, I want to talk about what happens in our brains neurologically and such. Um, you know, some of the brain-associated deficits uh, from addiction are severe, like the disruption of communication pathways, changes in the physical structure of the brain, memory loss, uh, deterioration of attention span, etc. Well, we learn we learned from le neuroscience that these can be ameliorated via recovery methods and therapies like CBT that rebuild the neural pathways. Uh, by the way, many of the ideas and methods of the 12 steps and AA are very similar to cognitive behavioral therapy. 
um, which is known to assist in restructuring the neural pathways of our thoughts and our perceptions. Uh, in fact, um, in a, a book that, that I really like, Glenn Rader's book, Modern 12-Step Recovery, he talks about how the 12-step program, um, when you look at it through the eyes of the CBT, it's rich in those principles. And I'm not going to read that whole thing, but uh, it's an interesting book. If you haven't read it, I, I do recommend it. I think it's, it's really worth it. Anyway, I believe that my sobriety has kind of been an evolutionary or a, like a developmental progression, which I've also seen in others who've given time, time. Uh, it takes a willingness to go through being uncomfortable and asking for help. And also sometimes just staying sober, even with the dissonance and the confusion. Um, it's kind of the painstaking part of the process, learning, you know, to embrace the present without using any of the many ways that I've used over the years to avoid or ignore discomfort. I mean, that's one of the most important lessons I've learned in my sobriety is to, to be willing to take the discomfort and, um, the the process is also um one of overcoming what what alan called stuckness in his new book on emotional sobriety and and i recommend the book i've had a chance to read it it's excellent um it's a maturing process i guess it's a way to put it a way to become more what they call differentiated in myself and with the relationships with others my experience suggests that the development happened in some stages. In early sobriety, for me, it was all about embracing all the thoughts and ideas and literature and behaviors and culture of AA. And I call that my getting sober stage. Uh, and it actually lasted for a while. And But later on, in what I kind of call the staying sober stage, I began to find it a lot more difficult to just go along with some of the ideas and the memes and the patterns that I, that I had earlier embraced it, um, just to get sober. Um, often I had a hard time listening in meetings to the pat phrases and ideas that I, I had, I'd used them myself. The emotional conflicts, the feelings of kind of cognitive dissonance were actually quite strong at times and, and sometimes lasted for quite a while. I mean, we're talking probably, maybe from five to 10 or 12 years of sobriety. Um, staying with those experiences and growing through them without reverting to all my old patterns of behavior was a very important process of my growth. Finally, I came to what I like to call the living sober stage, um, more emotional sobriety, uh, a willingness to be authentic uh, about my own experience and strength and hope even when it varied from ideas from my earlier years of sobriety or from those of some of the you know more standard memes of AA. Um, it's why I often say that the old ideas I have to let go of are the ones I got yesterday. They sometimes are the ones that get in the way. I had a friend in early sobriety who used to say that we come in as ostriches with our heads stuck in the sand and pretty soon we become parrots and we have all the answers no all the, you could have asked me i could have told you all the answers you needed exactly what you needed to do but if we stick around we can become eagles and soar above the pat answers and the emotional baggage of our history so let me geek out a little bit with some science here um there's some interesting things being discovered in a in a field oh let me let me share the screen here for a minute. Um, in in the, if I can get to it, there we go. In a field called interpersonal neurobiology. Interpersonal neuro, neurobiology sounds like a big <laughs> deal, but it, it is exactly what it sounds like. Interpersonal and the neurology and the biology. Uh, it's a study of how we attach and grow and interconnect throughout life. How, how the genes and environments interconnect and interact to create who we are and how we treat each other and in our uh, relationships our cultures etc um it's a fascinating field um 
and if anyone is interested you can certainly email me later i'd be happy to give you my rather long reading list so some of you might know something about this field because it's gotten a lot of play with respect to um, recovering from trauma uh, i'm not going to get into the the trauma aspects of it i want to focus on some other things that i think explain a lot about getting and staying and living sober for instance we know uh that the way our brains are wired uh, the way the neurons connect inside the brain has a lot to do with how we perceive and react to things and how our brains work physiologically and it used to be and, and I, i'm actually old enough to remember when people thought that once you reached a certain age those connections were permanent um and uh, now we know that there's this thing called neuroplasticity um those connections are changeable and it's an important phenomenon of the brain it's it's why people can change um and it and it's true throughout life even for somebody as old as me uh there's a saying in neuroscience neurons that fire together wire together and kind of simplistically that's basics of how habits work how i gained expertise in in playing guitar or even in acting uh, you know, I did it for 10,000 times and I, it got wired in. So the reverse is also true though. If you stop doing things, those, those neurons don't keep wiring together. They loosen up. So that wiring gets reduced so we can recover from addictions of all sorts. Um, you know, you just need to find a way to stop doing the activities that reinforce the addiction and start doing the things that reinforce sobriety. Um, but there's there's more to it than just that. And I'd kind of like to to um, get on that. Let me share this one. Um, researchers have recognized that interpersonal relations actually have a profound impact on the nature of the brain and how it functions via the transmission of energy and information that is not necessarily something that we even perceive on a conscious level and it doesn't require thought and it doesn't require language for instance um, in early childhood development uh, attachment to a caregiver is an extremely important factor in a child's emotional and mental and physiological development uh, in addition to the way that the brain gets structured physically and functions so it's not a function of language or even thinking the early childhood years are a formative years for the brain and its structure without use of the rational or what we would consider the rational or the linguistic parts of the brain the good news <laughs> <laughs> is that this extends into adulthood. So there is a transmission of energy and information that occurs between all people that's not necessarily something perceived on a conscious level or that requires thought or language. Um, the uh, I, I want to give you one more thing that's kind of interesting. We also know that the brain is capable of change at any time and that social interactions are a primary source of brain regulation, growth, and health. In fact, any meaningful relationship can reactivate neuroplastic processes and actually change the structure of the brain. I think that's a really, uh, a, a really interesting observation it kind of reminds me of what we used to hear in meetings listen to the music of aa the power is not in the words it's in the music of the heart it's actually kind of underneath the words so to speak um so as we know the energy and information transferred from a caregiver is transformational in the child and so the energy and information in a family or a group or a culture or a nation can also be transformational um, with respect to the the neurobiology of of people who are in that group i believe that's why the fellowship and meetings are such a vital aspect not only in the first stage of physical sobriety but in emotional sobriety as well because that energy and information is transmitted even without necessarily 
having the cognitive or linguistic involvement. Now, the implications of this for how we get and maintain and continue in sobriety, I think are pretty clear. Some people call it <laughs> sobriety by osmosis. <laughs> you get your ass in the chair and but there's a lot to be said for just suiting up and showing up. You know, our interpersonal relationships profoundly impact us and our sobriety. However, <laughs> there's a downside to it as well. So if you were here for our initial workshop, um, you might recall my presentation on spiritual bypassing. Uh, you know, before I ever got to AA, I spent about nine years in a, a fundamentalist evangelical group that, well, I'd actually call it a cult at this point. Um, in fact, I began my interest in, in interpersonal neurobiology partly as an effort to understand how did I go from being this freewheeling, psychedelic-taking uh, alcoholic interested in all kinds of things like Buddhism and Taoism, and I was full of idealism. And then I became what I became in that fundamentalist group. I mean, the beliefs and the behaviors of that group even became pretty far out from mainstream fundamentalism. Some of the things that eventually caused me to leave that religious group hung around in my mind and body far past the time when I left the group and even beyond the years after I got sober, even though I did all the step work and I did therapy, that stuff still hung on. And some of the shame and the guilt from those years and the effects of that group took years before they were finally gone. Well, the reason I bring up that cult is some people have identified kind of the cult-like aspects of the AA fellowship. Um, some people may not like to hear that, <laughs> but it is true. Uh, I, I don't think AA is a cult, but it, there are cult-like aspects. I wonder how many people leave AA because they, they've become dissatisfied with some of the common beliefs that are espoused by mainstream AA in and out of the rooms. Um, I think things like, for instance, I heard somebody saying defects of character were the cause of your alcoholism or, or the need to identify with personality traits that maybe aren't really theirs. Um, you know, Bill tended to generalize his own personality and behaviors as the typical alcoholic behavior and thinking. And I, I, for several years of my sobriety, I tried to fit myself into that same mold. It was a, a while before I realized that a lot of those traits really didn't apply to me. And I, I just kind of wonder how many of these suicides and slips and, and that kind of thing may have been a result of feeling different and not really a part of those mainstream representations of an alcoholic in AA. How many people didn't feel like they could be or were authentic and could be honest about who they were? So in my own experience, I began the long and sometimes uh, painful process of differentiation when I recognized I just wasn't being authentically true to my own lived experience. There's, there's this kind of AA speak that I had to let go of. You know, in any group, any group, no matter what group it is, how you talk about things is part of how you know that you belong and how the group knows that you belong. So what happens when in your, an effort to be true to yourself you also begin to say things that don't fit the usual jargon. Well, I think I was fortunate. The one thing I didn't do was I didn't drink or use when I was going through that stage. But to me, it is part of the developmental cycle toward a greater emotional sobriety. I, I began moving away from what I kind of think of as a codependent relationship with AA toward a greater interdependence. And interpersonal relationships can be a bulwark for that process. Um, and I had some really wonderful people who helped me during those years, but they can also be an impediment. So one of the reasons I like free thinkers meeting format is its emphasis on keeping an open mind and, and respecting others, even if 
even if or when I might disagree. <laughs> Sometimes I've actually even been wrong. I, I know it's hard to believe, but it happens. So anyway, I want to move on to a couple of things that I've learned about the process of growth that can occur from these interpersonal relationships and can help us uh, into a more emotionally sober life. So you might also keep in mind that these inner and interrelationships, just like the path of sobriety itself, uh, it's not a linear process, uh, even though there do seem to be some general stages. In fact, over time, just staying sober and doing the many things we've already talked about in the workshops, interacting with others will change the structures of the brain, the way you think, the way one perceives oneself in reality. It's, you know, it's true what they used to say, give time, time. And another thing is that much of what we do, it, it, it's, it's about what we do, not what we think. Um, the old saying goes, you can't change your behavior with your thinking, you change your thinking with your behavior. I think it's true. So um, in, in our past workshops, we've talked about the use of introspection through the steps or any other form of self-development. Um, there are other obstacles that can be overcome with doing the work, um, codependency, spiritual bypassing, perfectionism. Many of those things, if you haven't already seen the earlier uh, workshops, you can review them there on our website at uh, es.freethinkerslivingsober.org. But um, in, those, in those workshops over the months, we did mention how important mindfulness is, um, or what I think this is probably what Dr. Berger means when he talks about presence. I wanna emphasize what I mean by this, and it's it's really well summed up by um, another quote from uh, um, from Glenn Rader's book. And I'll share that on the screen. What he says is mindfulness is the self-management of being fully present and engaged in the moment. It means being aware of your environment, thoughts and emotions without judgment or distraction. It is a central tenet of modern psychology. Another way to view mindfulness is to think of yourself as being an impartial observer of your own thoughts, emotions, and actions. Um, in my own experience, uh, becoming more mindful has been aided by a consistent practice of meditation. Now, when I first started getting serious about meditation in the early years of my sobriety, what I was taught was to sit at the same time every day or times, if you want to do it more than once, and start with just a few minutes. I started with five minutes, and that built up over time. And the most important thing I learned was to be consistent, um, to do it the same time and, the, and, and every day. I, I would like to also mention what I mean by meditation, because I hear a lot of people talk about meditation in a lot of different ways. At the heart of what I mean by meditation is the quiet monitoring or observation of both my awareness and any object of that awareness, like my breath or my thoughts or the feelings in my body, physical and emotional. Um, this, is, this is not the same as what I commonly hear people talk about meditation when they're simply talking about thinking about something for some time. You'll see that in the, in the uh, 12 and 12 where they tell you to meditate on this prayer, but it's not really a meditation like I am using the term. It's more of a contemplative thing. So, uh, and some people talk about it, well, if I just sit by the ocean and, you know, kind of zone out, well, I'm sure those experiences are worthwhile and enjoyable, but they're not really the kind of exercises of the awareness that I mean by meditation that, that really help me to become more mindful in everyday terms. So in addition to monitoring my breath, my thoughts, my feelings, there's also um, what I've found is a, a kind of a regulatory uh, component, which over time and practice, I've been able to uh, I've been able to learn. 
it's an increasing ability to uh, to monitor the flow of my inner experience and the flow of my interpersonal relations. There's a, there's a technical term for that. Um, the technical term is interoception. Uh, I don't know if y'all have ever heard of that term before. It's kind of a, like I said, it's kind of a technical term, but it's the perception of sensations from inside the body. It's something the mind of uh, the brain already does. So really it's about learning how to, to kind of tap into that ability on a more conscious way. And it's a mindfulness technique that helps answer this one question, how do I feel? But at a, a deeper level than just the order, well, I feel sad or I feel crummy or, um, because what it took me years to understand is that a lot of my memory and conflicts and emotional difficulties were actually held in my body. So getting in touch with the body in this way is an aspect of interoception, aided by a meditation technique called insight meditation or Vipassana. And it's a skill that can really help in moments of extreme emotion or difficulties. Uh, I remember being, I was in a meeting and at the end of the meeting, someone started yelling at me because she thought that something I said was directed at her and meant as a demeaning comment. My first and my first internal response, of course, was fear and defensiveness. My gut started churning, my breath increased. But fortunately, I was able to stay present and listen to my body instead of reacting to her. And while the interaction was not pleasant, I was not drawn into her anger or her perception of what had occurred. And I was able to respond with a fairly calm explanation of my own perception. And it didn't result in her being less angry <laughs> or confrontational or with her agreeing with my perception, but it did result in my walking away without reacting in my old pattern of yelling and defending myself. By the way, using the text of, um, techniques of nonviolent communication can be very effective too uh, in learning how to deal with those kind of situations, actually with, with most interpersonal relations. Um, we'll try and post some of the NVC resources in the chat. Um, I think one of the last things I want to talk about is that most important things I learned in all this was what I call seeing the flag. Um, when I get reactive to someone or something, it is a flag for me that tells me there's something going on. And I'm not, uh, not necessarily talking about getting upset because you're seeing something going on that is really wrong or somebody's getting abused or something like that. Really, I'm talking about listening to my internal reactions to what's going on in my environment. And if I'm having a really strong reaction to someone, it's very often a clear indication it's an area for me to work on. I mean, for instance, I remember uh, being in a meeting some time ago when a, a, a gentleman started sharing in a kind of a preachy manner. He was, he was actually preaching about his particular religious beliefs uh, that were kind of evangelical and fundamentalist bent. And, you know, while I think this is certainly inappropriate in a meeting, my reaction was much bigger than that. My gut started churning. Um, I knew there was more going on here than just a share that was out of bounds. So he did this rather frequently over a period of time. So I spent those that time, instead of arguing or anything else, I spent it checking in with my meditation. And what I learned was that the real problem was I still hadn't resolved some of my own feelings about my religious training and my old ideas. So to me, that too is a form of interpersonal relationship that aided me in my efforts to become more emotionally sober. So uh, having practiced all these things we've covered today <laughs> and in our previous workshops, I'm now completely emotional sober, right? <laughs> I have it at all times. Not. <laughs> uh, you know, emotional sobriety isn't just another way to avoid the things I don't want to feel. Uh, in fact, Emotional sobriety isn't, isn't a there, I don't believe that we get to, but it's kind of an ongoing process of maturation and growth, uh, a way to embrace and be with what I feel and who I am. 
uh, not only that, but it's in relationship with those around me that I gain the most benefit from all of this kind of work. My own way of looking at it is that uh, the essence, um, the essence of emotional sobriety simply means that I'm able to feel the whole spectrum of human emotions without using addictive behaviors or avoidance techniques. So that instead of reacting, it's about responding from a mature and a mindful state. And even though difficult times happen, <laughs> my emotional state is generally one of contentment with myself and my life. And I'm able to maintain, or sometimes I have to return to emotional equilibrium when life or my wife <laughs> throws me a curveball. <laughs> It's, it's also good to remember, as Maria pointed out in our last workshop, and I, I really enjoyed this, that how I'm feeling may not be the most important thing going on. So emotional sobriety also has to do with having the inner space to be able to be in the present with what's going on around me and not just within me. Um, and as I've given time time, I've gotten better at this, although I'm definitely not complete. I should mention that, you know, my significant other relationship is a continuing opportunity to see where I need to grow and a reminder that there are still some areas of immaturity that may need some compassion and understanding. I was pretty anti-dependent when I got to AA. You know, the old saying, I'd never be a member of any group that would have me as a member. <laughs> well, it's taken me a lot of years to let go of some of those tendencies. And I have really come to appreciate the relationships I have with people and, and especially the members of free thinkers and other secular AA groups and a lot of the mainstream groups as well, some lovely, lovely people. So I hope that something in all this has been helpful or as my old friend, Billy B used to say, I hope something I didn't say helps you as much as what others haven't said have helped me. <laughs> So I want to leave you with a quote, um, if you don't mind, from, uh, from Alan's new book uh, as kind of a final thought, which I think is a kind of a hopeful, hopeful thing as well. Let's see if I can share the screen for this one. I really enjoy this. It says, we possess an inner wisdom to be what we can be. This is the growth force that moves us toward physical, emotional, and spiritual wholeness. You know this force because you've experienced it. Trust the process. So thank you all for being here. I am really looking forward to hearing what my fellow panelists have to say, and especially to what any of you might want to share. And thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, let's see. I'm going to pick on one of my uh, two co-panelists co uh, first. I don't know which one yet, but um, I, I just want to say this being about our interpersonal relationships and this being the fifth of uh, five, that just uh, working with the three of you has been an absolute delight. Uh, there are no people I would want to do something like this with more. I would go to your own, you alone uh, workshops. There are plenty of other people, some of them in this room here that I'd be just as happy to work with, but it has been absolutely fantastic. And, uh, and thanks for uh, thinking of me uh, in, in putting this on and, and it's been just great. Um, well, Alan and Maria. I know Maria doesn't like to go first, but John already went first. So you're up. Dinker. Hi, everybody. John, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Just a treat to listen to what a far ranging, wide ranging and interesting and detailed talk. Thank you. Um, so I, I have so many responses and I think probably we'll bounce a couple of these things back and forth amongst us. But the thing that I most react to um, in, in, in both a pushback way and also a really kind of like, this will keep me thinking wonderfully, which John, that always happens when you talk. Uh, I just, I think about the things for days. What I actually noted was agreeing, agreeing, agreeing until we got to the idea of 
what the sponsor said about if you have boundaries and you're, if you're using your boundaries to get somebody else to change their behavior. And I'm going to take this somewhere very specific. As a, as a woman and a female identified person in this culture, the idea that my boundaries are a problem is a problem. And so like, this is a super invented, this is super important for people who work within the program in emotional sobriety. Any 12 step program deals with issues of gender, of right, of, um, of boundaries, of language. All of this is so important. And I feel like now we need to do a whole nother series because it is a lifelong process to figure out where I end and you begin. And if you learn the language of Maria, your boundaries are a problem. And throw that, I'm not saying you're throwing that, but like I've been in these rooms a long time and I'm still trying to navigate. When is it okay for me to say, dude, back up? So that's a super interesting question for all of us here is to think about like in emotional sobriety, what does it look like for me to go, I am okay with the way the program's working right now. I'm not okay with, and so that's a much broader question. I just want to speak up about that slightly because long-term like the, the living sober, the three stages you talk about, which is a great insight. Um, long-term sobriety, you're gonna go, or I certainly have been in a very dynamic state of comfort or discomfort with sobriety and with the communities that, that operate within the sobriety constructs. Some years I've just hated it. I'm like, this is stupid, everything's a cliche, and I've not drunk. And some years I'm like, I love these cliches, they're my favorite cliches, and I've not drunk. You know, some years it's like, I hate all the meetings. Some years I love all the meetings. You know, I mean, just who cares what I feel about them? What I have found is that over a long, long period of time now, <clears throat> kind of doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. If I can find a way in that day to keep my nose clean and keep myself sober, and I do find that way within these rooms. And some days it's because I don't agree with what you said. And some days it's because of what you didn't say. And some days it's because you absolutely lit up a corner of sobriety that I had no idea was there. And I want to thank you, John, for doing all of those things this time. So thanks all of you for being here today. I'll shut up and I'll uh, bounce to Alan. Right, Joe? Yep. <laughs> thanks, Mario. Follow that. Oh boy, that's that was wonderful. I, I, but the sticking your tongue out at the end of the talk, I think was really that was the cherry on top of the Sunday for me. That was wonderful. So let's talk about this because this is this is so. Uh, there's so many things that you said, John. Um, but before I go into that, I want to echo what you're saying, Joe. First of all, the to all of you, I've really this has been a an incredible journey these last five meetings that we've had. I am sad that it's coming to an end and I'm glad it's coming to an end. It means that we've really done some nice work together. And I think we're leaving a nice, nice archive for people that want to explore this further. And there's so much to explore about it. I think that's the exciting thing. People write to me all the time and they say, you're really helping me understand the next step in my recovery. And I really believe that this is the case. But this is what Bill was saying, that there's so much to this program and so many possibilities. So I want to put it in this context, and I think it might help us. Look, we all start life completely dependent on um, our mother for all our nurturing and our, all our nourishment. She provides us with oxygen. She provides us with nutrition everything through the umbilical cord. She protects us in that amniotic sac that we're living in. Um, and all of this, all of that, it just says that we start life completely dependent on our environment. And I think as you so well said, John, is that the course, the arc of development is moving from this environmental dependency or what I like to think of as environmental support towards self-support. Now, physically, we are just hardwired to move in that direction. As soon as we're born, we start to take some responsibility for our lives, or what I like to say is to support ourselves. What do we do? We have to take our breath. Now, we provide oxygen rather than oxygen being provided. Now, we're still dependent on oxygen being in the environment. Thank God it's there. But I have a role. I have to participate in the inhalation of that oxygen and the exhalation of the carbon dioxide. 
That's how I process. That's my, the way I make contact with my environment to get my needs met. Well, that physical movement towards what we can be towards supporting ourselves just unfolds. We eventually go from crawling to walking, from walking to running, from making sounds to developing language. All of this is an attempt for me to make better and better contact with my environment to meet my needs, to become what I can be, to support myself, to get my needs met. Now, I can't do that alone. I am in relationship to, I am in a relationship to my environment, to the people environment, my environment, and et cetera. But I think the problem here becomes that when now we have to mature emotionally, spiritually, cognitively, something gets in the way. And this is where, where the problem starts. I, I love what uh, Fritz Perl said, an elephant does not want to be a flower. It just is an elephant. You know, a cat doesn't want to be a dog. It's just a cat. It's satisfied with being what it is. Our problem comes in is that we can look at ourselves and reflect on ourselves. That's good and bad. Because when we start to do this whole comparison thing or this idea that I've got to be something other than I am to be okay, there's a lot of problems that exist. One of which is that I need you to be a certain way to be okay. I think what you said about setting boundaries here is very important, but we have to understand that boundary setting in the following way. When I set my boundary with you, I'm setting it for my sake. Now, I hope you'll respect that. And I would love it if you did. But if you don't, it's up to me to respect that boundary and listen to myself. You see, when I'm emotionally dependent or I depend on environmental support, what I try to do is to get you to do for me what I can't do for myself. So if you don't respect me, then I'm just stuck. I feel, oh my God, you know, God, if you love me, you would respect me. How can you do that? No, if you don't respect me, that's when I've got to stand up and respect myself and say, look, you know, I, this is not okay for me. You know, I've set this boundary. You're not respecting it. I need to do whatever I need to do at that moment to make myself feel safe. That's my job in every relationship. Emotional sobriety is helping us learn how to stand on our own two feet and let go of all of these ideas that I need you to be a certain way for me to be okay. I don't need you to be a certain way for me to be okay. I need to be a certain way to be okay. If you cooperate with that, great. I'd love it. That's fine. If not, okay, that can't be helped for whatever reason. And if I'm you know, differentiating myself, as John was talking about, one of the hallmarks of emotional sobriety is stopping, not taking things personally stopping that process and saying everything is about me. It's not about me. What you do is about you. What I do is about me. It's not about what I do. You're not doing what you do because of me. You're doing it because of who you are. Even if you're directing it at me, it's about you and vice versa. These ideas help me start to differentiate myself psychologically and emotionally instead of being fused with everything and thinking everything is about me. I have to tease that apart so that my emotional system is operating separately from my intellectual system. But when I'm undeveloped, these things happen like this. I can't sort out the difference between thoughts and feelings. They're all one. So this becomes a very, very, very important thing. Now, the other thing that, that is clear is if I take a stance and I'm in relationship with you and you don't like it, are you going to try to manipulate me to give myself up? Well, of course you are. I, I love what Dr. Gerald Zook said. He called these things silence-inducing strategies. So if I say something you don't like, you might say something, well, how dare you say that? That's outrageous. And you're doing that because you don't like what I said in hopes that you're going to shut me down or you're going to tell me I'm being ridiculous. Well, I, I might want to be ridiculous. <laughs> if you don't like it, you don't have to like it. But when you try to shut me down is where that now I've got to learn how to take care of myself. So the final thought I have about this, and John, you, you mentioned this, and, and it was right on, 
is I think one of the ways, what one of the things that happens when we put on these emotional sobriety lenses, and that's what I like to think of these as, it's a different way of looking at ourselves, our life, um, at what happens in our life, all of these things. Trouble no longer means something's wrong. Trouble is like a spotlight in this Zoom program. It just highlights us on something that we need to pay attention to. And John, I thought that when you unpack some of these things, you really showed us very well how when we pause, when we're in trouble, you know, when we're struggling, that we give ourselves a chance now to listen to our second thought, not our first our first thought can be very reactive and can come from this fused place. But when I live in that pause, what Dr. Uh, Victor Frankl said, you know, in the space between a stimulus and our reaction is, is our ability to choose. And in that choice is our freedom. And that's what emotional sobriety is about. It's about emotional freedom. It's about not being caught and being reactive um, like we've all been. So Joe, with that, I'll turn this over to you. Oh, wow. Uh, John, what you said and what she said and what he said. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, this, this has been great. You know, my, uh, you know, you could, I think I can measure how well I'm doing by my relationships. If I'm all super peaceful and happy with myself and feel like I'm fit and there's uh, twisted metal and fire and wreckage everywhere around me, um, maybe uh, take another look at that. Uh, you know, there, there was a, like it, it's just a, a low level of maturity to take care of my side of the street. I'm OK. So I'm OK. Uh, you know, it uh, it. It's just just a, another level to be able to say, you know, I am my brother's sisters and others keeper. You know, I, I do have a, a role to play in the world and I have to interact with them. It doesn't mean I can't cut people out and, and put up boundaries. I, I think that's part of it. Creating stress is sometimes very important. There was a time uh, in my uh, sobriety and in my life where I wanted your approval and I was willing to do anything to get it. And um, that's, uh, um, that's where my need is greater than my principles. And, uh, and I, was, uh, I had a very adaptive morality and a very adaptive uh, politics. And I could be in the horoscopes if I thought you were into me. And, you know, it, it just, you know, that was, that was, I needed that so desperately. It might have been my first drug of choice was attention. And, and now at a, you know, not a, a, a completely self-actualized state, but further along, I still prefer to be approved of than disapproved of, but I'm not willing to do anything to get it. I, I have principles that I, I found in searching in recovery, uh, the twelve-step process and and beyond that, uh, and they uh, are that they are important to me, and they're more important than your approval of me. They're more important than me getting what I want. Uh, they stand for themselves, and they 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 give me a sense of identity where I had no identity, so I needed your uh, approval. Um, John said that the idea of the mirror, right, you know, uh, telling his sponsor, you're just the reflection, you know, in with my own life partner, we're, we're very aware that as much as what he said is true, you got to see past the mirror and see the person that's there, that I am incapable of seeing you, any of you in this room, as you are. I can only see you the way I am, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I can't, uh, I, d I haven't found a way to transcend that, you know, I just, uh, you know, like we can get into this whole, uh, you know, is there oneness, is there separation, non-duality, Paul's the walrus, kuka, kachu, kuku, kachu, 
but um, uh, you know, the, the, you know that there is only so far my empathy can go to you know uh, experiencing another person's experience and that sort of thing, and and this this comes with limits. Uh, I mean, it's a great idea. I uh, had a therapist who uh, taught me something I thought I knew because I'd seen the book cover, uh, transactional analysis. And uh, it's kind of old and uncool now, but it's still very true. And it's about, uh, you know, uh, sort of parent, uh, adult and child uh, emotional states and how we trigger each other by, uh, you yeah, know, it, it was great. And I wasn't there for research. Uh, I wasn't there for my next blog. I was there because I was 20 years sober and in the worst emotional crisis of my life. And there was fire all around me. My relationships were not good. They were either superficial or full of uh, fury and anger. And uh, I, I really, uh, I wanted to fix it. And uh, and I, I needed help. And I, I got the help I needed. And it was... Uh, was very helpful. It's helped me be a better dad, right? I mean, most people, I, I got to have my kids in sobriety because I uh, grew up here. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the worst pain I ever hear from people is the remorse uh, of uh, the harm they had done their, their own children. And, uh, and I wasn't a drunk dad, but I wasn't a perfect dad either, right? You know, I wasn't able to sort of transcend, you know, my, my not being able to empathize with my son or my daughter in a way where uh, I could see through their eyes. I, I still am trying to control a little bit. I'm trying, you know, it's it, it's just so hard to break through, but, but those relationships are important. Zoom rooms are a great way to learn that, right? We, we used to meet with 12 of our closest friends in our meeting, and now there's 50. And everyone has a different etiquette in terms of how to behave, right? Uh, uh, some groups have lists of things you can and can't do. Have your camera on or have it off. And, you know, put, unplug your phone. Shut up. <laughs> right? The millennials have taken over. We're on their turf now. And uh, leave those baby boomer rules, uh, you know, for the 20th century, right? We can look at them in a museum. But, uh, you know, so, so we're learning from the next generation. And, uh, and these Zoom rooms are, you know, like, it, it's, you know, not everyone behaves the way I want them to. And I, I, I gotta, you, you know, that ability to take someone aside, in a physical room and just have a one-on-one -on -one with them um, is more difficult uh, in this. Uh, I, I haven't found a perfect way to do it. I'm still working on it. Just like sponsoring is a little bit different, but but not worse. I mean, AA, uh, you know, just to use an example of one 12 step fellowship, added members from uh, uh, 2020 to 2021, 61,000 new members in Alcoholics Anonymous without physical meetings. So the idea that these are uh, some sort of second rate way of communicating is, uh, is just uh, found to be mythical and untrue. Uh, so uh, where are we for time? Uh, do you wanna just chit chat a little more or have our break or? Uh, uh, I'll defer to you, John. There's probably a slide that would tell me about that. Is there? Well, um, um, you're the moderator, so <laughs> I would I, I would like to make one point about you, you were talking about not being able to, um, yeah, the limits of empathizing with another person, and I, I think one of the points that my sponsor was trying to make to me is that I should at least make the effort. Yeah. And it took me a long time to recognize that I spent more time thinking about what I was going to say while someone else was talking <laughs> instead of listening to what the other person had to say and trying to understand where they were coming from. And I, I mentioned uh, nonviolent communication uh, in VC. And one of the things that I think is really uh, good about NVC is it really focuses on making sure you have heard what the other person has said by asking pertinent questions. 
Um, and that's just one aspect of it, but um, hopefully Kat will have posted some of the references to that. But I, I just wanted to mention that. Thanks. And we can talk or we can go right to participants or we can take a break. It's up to the moderator. <laughs> So in just a couple minutes, we're going to the uh, participation part of this uh, meeting, and I'd uh, love to hear from you. And you can jump the queue if you want to sort of raise your virtual hand. We'll get to as many people as we can and um, do as little blathering as uh, needed. And uh, at this point, everyone should still should be able to turn on their video if they like. Wonderful. And I'll be right back. Uh, just to avail of this opportunity, uh, yeah. uh, lest I don't get it later, just to thank you all for, uh, for this wonderful series. Uh, I wasn't fortunate enough to make it to the first one, but uh, I've loved the whole thing. Um, uh, it really um, compounds the truth that I'm on the right path, sticking with the right people, you know? Win with the, stick with the winners, win with the stickers. So just just to say thank you all, and and nice thanks for the walrus in your life. Thanks for the walrus. <laughs> Alan, didn't per, didn't pearls also have something to say about elephant shit? About what the yeah he did say <laughs> he said it keeps getting bigger and bigger, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He says we all start with chicken shit, and then we start moving towards more elephant shit, and then finally, <laughs> right. and finally we get real. Yeah, that's right. Is that, that like, is that like that song, uh, Wooden Shits? Oh, no, that's a different yeah. song. <laughs> oh, oh, that's bad, John. That's bad. So, Alan, can you remind us when your meeting is? Hey, uh, Alan, I can post that. Uh, Tom Thursday night Rod Ash will post that. It's Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. It's really grown into a wonderful meeting. We are now looking at how the 12 steps can help us achieve or how the 12 steps help us achieve emotional sobriety. And, and the meeting is really from a very, very intentional practice of, of these mm -hmm. principles along the lines of emotional sobriety. So it's really becoming a great, great discussion that we've been having. Are you, are you having a meeting directly after the book launch this week? That is correct. Yes, yeah. sir. Thank you. Thank you. Because anything worth doing is worth overdoing. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wanted to mention also, we are going to, um, we're going to start a new series of workshops on the last Sunday of each month. Um, where we'll have a, a, about a 30 minute speaker or maybe even a panel or something like that. Just about, um, we're calling it the what did we decide to call it joe <laughs> uh varieties of sober of experience. secular experience um navigating sobriety in the secular aa way and um the first the very first speaker is going to be this guy i really like him kevin g who wrote one breath at a time um years ago and uh is a pretty well-known speaker among buddhists but also a 12-step speaker. And he'll be the first one. That's going to be on uh, the last Sunday of June. And I think we'll, hopefully we'll have that information to be able to post in the chat. I don't know. Joe, do we have the? Uh, um, yeah, I've got some information on that for our wrap-up. Yeah, I've cool. got like a Zoom meeting room and all that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, and it's going to be more, basic stuff right mm -hmm. like uh more newcomery stuff or anybody or yep. stuff than yeah the focus really is yeah the focus really is on newcomers and and um and people new to secular sobriety yeah We've i love kevin's that. kevin's 12-step workbook uh is wonderful for anybody kind of doing the newcomery thing if you want to go the secular route it's, uh, I, I believe he uses his last name on the, on the book. So it's, you know, yes. okay. So Kevin Griffin's 12 steps, Buddhism in the 12 steps is pretty great. Pretty great. Yeah. And, uh, unless I'm terribly mistaken, uh, 
uh, we're going to team up, Mari and I, on a Rebellion Dogs radio show uh, sometime soon. And Alan, while we're here, I'll just book you for a book launch uh, thing too. <laughs> we'll do that as well. So uh, it's over. <laughs> and the comeback tour is coming soon. <laughs> how many uh who uh comeback tours were there i don't know I, I think the first one was 1983 the first uh comeback tour you know, uh, okay uh enough from uh the uh the traveling wilburys is that what we're doing <laughs> uh, so uh so let's let's get into the participation point just a couple of points i just posted them we've got a timekeeper it's uh cat just to keep this less you know uh, the next speaker and more y- your own shared experience or a, a question if you got it that'd be fine but we would like to get as many people participating as we'd like to and uh to do that uh, let us know by using your uh, virtual hand, which you'll find in the three dots if you're on a phone or on a computer or a Mac. It'll be down at the little, look for the reaction with the little smiley face as a raise hand thing. If you're a pro Zoomer, you know all that already. We're going to kick off with Catherine. How are you, Catherine? Joe, Joe, I'd like to tell everybody this is Cat. What I will do yeah. is just say three minutes and then it'll be time for you to wrap it up. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Thank you, everyone. Um, very insightful. Unfortunately, I just found this and I missed the last four. So um, I'm an adult child of an alcoholic and a, covering, a recovering codependent. Um, I love Viktor Frankl also. Um, he said, what is, what is to give light must endure burning. And that's what came to mind when I was just jotting down notes as you all were speaking. And I mean, I gained so much from this, but um, the skill of listening without interpretation, you know, what John was saying, um, that is such a skill to actually listen because I always listen with interpretation, with judgment and in my own head. And people would say, well, you didn't even see me. I said, of course I didn't see you, it was in my own head. You know, I didn't observe anyone around me. So, um, you know, like a lot of what was said um, to me is like emotional intelligence. Like as in recovery, it's only been six years, but um, I've worked really hard in six years. But but increasing emotional intelligence by looking at me and seeing what I'm doing is so much more um, relief than trying to interpret other people you know, and trying to figure out what did they mean by that? And what do they love me? And how much do they love me? And will they love me? And what if I say this, will they accept that? And I mean, really, it's like losing your life. I mean, it's living, but not living. Um, And then, you know, it was like, what I was doing before recovery, it was like, I was going to an empty well. Um, That was my life until, you know, beginning recovery, going to an apple tree, trying to find a pear, you know, that kind of thing, just failing and failing and failing. I said to my fiance, maybe we can fail better this time, you know, um, being this old and getting married soon. So, you know, maybe I can fail better and um, and not not thinking of speaking um, and responding has, you know, been a real challenge to actually hear what is being said, to actually have it drift through. And when Alan was talking about your mother gave you everything you needed. Yeah, Three blood minutes. flow. Thank you. Blood flow. And I thought, oh, God, help me. When that was said, I thought, oh, God, help me for my parents, um, alcoholism and all of that. So thank you very much. Got a lot out of it. And um, hope you guys do this again. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Catherine. And uh, fellow panelists, uh, just butt right in if you got comments uh, anywhere along the way. I would uh, welcome your input. Um, uh, Carla, you had your hand up. Hi, I'm Carla. Uh, So great to be here. Thank you, panelists, for speaking and everyone for being here. I am long time uh, recovery person. Um, 
from alcohol and all the things and exploring, wanting to go deeper than I find in a lot of uh, AA meetings, although I recognize the value in them. Um, so I'm just new to the secular AA thing, trying to, been a long time Buddhist and all that, but uh, just trying to dig more deeply into, you know, my own knowing and learning about my own self um, and, you know, the whole self-acceptance thing and um, taking myself seriously, you know, and in the, in a good sense of what I do, what I put into my body is important and how I treat myself is important and how I treat myself when I'm in a triggering situation is important. So all of that to me is the same thing as emotional sobriety. So thank you so much, everybody just wanted to say hi and really glad to be around open-minded uh, people who are uh, in this journey. Thanks a lot. Thanks, yeah. The millennials sure had it right. This is great. <laughs> I mean, I this just couldn't have been done, you know, 10 years ago, right? And uh, all of these people who I got to work with over this uh, five series project, I mean, I, I, I love them, uh, but I hardly ever get to see them, but we're all next door neighbors now. That's, that's the cool thing about it. Just a few squares over. Um, Joe, I got to do my first Instagram live show with Dr. Sean Horn on friday really? it was such a trip and it was like i'm so new i've never been on instagram so it's like there's this other world out there i mean it's amazing what this has really done and i agree with you man this has made some things possible for us as a community you know my, my buddy tom rutledge says is that that covid created this kind of large um uh, retreat that we've all been on that we've all been able to join each other in these virtual rooms and, and what a gift it's given us. What a gift. Yeah. It, it sped up the handing of the torch from uh, the uh, baby boomers to the millennials because we're on their platform in their world now. And uh, I mean, you know, newsflash, uh, millennials are 40 years old. They turned 40 years old last year. The, the first ones, the youngest of them are 25 you know, if you if you think we're going to debate if they're in charge or not, that boat's left. Yeah. <laughs> they now have the stewardship of peer to peer and all that sort of thing. And and uh, sorry with what how we left it for you, but uh, I'm looking forward to some of your new ideas. Thank you, millennials. Uh, John M, please. Hello there. <clears throat> My name is John, and I have memories of an abusive childhood which entitles me to break out in addictions. So I do addictions real well. And recently I've broken out in a new addiction. My latest addiction, I don't know if it's an addiction or a delusion, is that the parasympathetic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system is highly involved in recovery from AA. And what that does is give me the gift of read looking at at AA and how it works and realizing I don't need to have a higher power. All I got to do is take humbling actions. And it also gives me the gift of uh, taking actions which can activate the parasympathetic nervous. And I'm feeling kind of lonely. So I would love to invite anybody who wants to discuss this kind of stuff to contact me. Uh, my one of my email addresses is John M at 12steppers.org. And I would like, so I'm feeling lonely. I would like to talk to other people who might be interested in this subject. And I'll put up an, another address in the email. And Alan, thank you so much for putting up this collection of people who are all interested in emotional sobriety. My background as an abused child lets me trigger very easily. And one of my big deals is to not trigger and remain calm and peaceful under all circumstances. Thank you for letting me share. Thanks so much, John. Wanda? Um, real quick, I want to thank everybody for the Zoom and the speakers and all the speakers. 
I just wanted Mar I think it's Maria. I just wanted her to speak a little bit more on what she was starting to say with regards to uh, boundaries. If she's still on the Zoom. Yep, she sure is. Somewhere. I am. And thank you very much for bringing that up. I think, you know, this actually ties into what uh, John was just saying also, and to what you know, John, our, our fearless leader was mentioning, part of the thing in long-term sobriety for me is, um, is recognizing that I don't, that I can think critically about the program. I can think critically about the way I'm interacting with people, even if I've been interacting with them that way for 40 years. And I can also think critically, not judgmentally necessarily, but critically about habituated inner relation, interpersonal relationship patterns that I think people do have. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about, uh, or what I was kind of getting at there is some of the truisms in the programs, <clears throat> in the 12 step programs, really hinge on the idea, as John said, that there is a type, there is an alcoholic type. And it does describe Bill very, very well. As a much younger person, as a woman from a different culture, it doesn't describe me all that well. And so those sort of that needing to fit oneself to the truisms, to the, to the language of the program has been tough for me. So a lot of what I'm talking about is when people come at me with, you know, the problem with your problem with this situation is you like the thing of like, if you're pointing your fingers, that means there are four, four, four pointing back at you. I'm sometimes saying this is true. There are four fingers pointing back at me and I have all kinds of problems and I'm responsible for all kinds of things. In this case, you're an asshole. You know what I mean? Like at some point you get to go, here's the line friends. And that doesn't mean you're being manipulative. It means they hit your boundary and you got to say back up. And so that's really, it's not complex. It's not about super complex stuff for me. Sometimes it's just, you know, yes, I'm often selfish. Yes. I'm often lots of awful things. Manipulative is not really one of my major character defects. However, I get called manipulative or I get told my boundaries are too stark. I have too many walls, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, I don't actually think that's true. And I'm not gonna, at least not this decade, maybe when I'm 57, I'll be like, yeah, you're right. I've been too bossy. But actually what I am now is trying to teach younger women and female identi identify people that it's okay to say back up because we've been told it's not. That's really where I'm going. Uh, if uh, any of you haven't heard it, there was a, a great talk on uh, gender in AA uh, that was uh, at our International Conference of Secular AA December 5th, our first virtual conference. The next one's in Europe in June. And um, it, it was just a packed house. And uh, it's one of the most listened to podcasts we have. Uh, just set uh, aasecular.org. Uh, you can find uh, those talks. Uh, if you can't find them, let me know. Uh, it was just uh, wonderful. It's uh, it's like a great song. You got to listen to it more than once. Uh, Della. Hello. Um, this is my third one that I attend. The first one was uh, No One's Coming. That one kind of sat with me for a while. But about boundaries, what I've learned about boundaries for myself is that when I set one with someone, or I set one for myself, really, I set one for myself, uh, it's, it's that what I do is I learn that I'm about accepting myself where I am. And what the other person teaches me is where they set boundaries for themselves. And if I don't respect their boundaries, it's because I haven't really accepted them where they are. And then I expect them to take care of me. Whereas um, I've had on occasions, they say, nope, I'm not going to do it. And yes, I've had to do, um, make decisions to take care of myself. So it, it's interesting about boundaries. I, I know some people have unrealistic expectations that when they set a boundary, it should be respected. And when it's not respected, there's something wrong with that person. But if you can avoid judging them badly or judging yourself badly, and looking at it from a realistic expectation that it's about accepting myself, accepting what I need and doing what I need to take care of myself. Um, so it was, I enjoyed the boundary thing today, which y'all talked about um, that other talk about me, no one's coming. We have an old joke here because I'm Cajun and I speak Cajun French. I've been in the program since 85. And so, uh, 
old joke is that there's been a hurricane and it is flooded and the man's on top of his roof. A truck, a boat comes by and he says, no, I'm waiting for God. And so another the helicopter, helicopter comes by and he says, I'm waiting for God. <laughs> so when he gets up to heaven, he says, what do you expect? I've said all kinds of people. So that I have to know one's coming resonated that when I'm in an emotional state, when I'm struggling, I have to get myself back at peace. The other thing about the talk today that I thought of is I value my sanity. I value my emotional well-being so much so that I will take care of me. I, I will take care of that because that's how important to the point where I will end a relationship if that's what needs to, be, needs to happen. Because there's some people that do trigger my history. I do have abuse. And so if they do trigger my history, they don't know they're triggering my history. I'm the one aware of that. I'm the one who have to read that internal dialogue that goes on. Um, I have sat with that and had all the feelings and then had to say, hey, what is it that I need to do to take care of myself and not put it on the other person? I don't think it's fair to the other person. Now, if they... If you're in a loving relationship and they're considerate and they're empath emphatic, they'll say, I'll try, I'll do my best. And you can appreciate that. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Della. Merci pas le français? Uh, that you've heard it all. <laughs> oh, mais ça, c'est beau quand même. Yeah. Anything more, Alan, on that? Oh. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Carlos. <laughs> Hi, my name is Carlos, and I want to thank for, this is the, the last one, and it's the first one that I watched um, from Portugal, and, uh, you know, I learned a lot during this presentation. I learned a very important thing for me, that it's my thoughts and my emotions are two separate things, you know, and that it's important to set the difference between them and not to react in conjunction with your emotions and your thoughts. I thought that was very, 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 very interesting for me in my recovery process. Uh, and uh, I, I'm also amazed at the, even in Portugal, which is a very traditional Catholic country uh, and a very traditional uh, AA or uh, community that was uh, uh, that was uh, sponsored by the Spanish uh, AA that it's very conservative too. Uh, the meetings have grown ex exponentially with Zoom, and a lot of yeah, lots lots of younger people are arriving at the groups that are went. Uh, that were physical and now are online because we're still under a lot of restrictions here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Glad you made it. All of these have been recorded and uh, they'll be posted if they haven't already. Tune. Hey, everyone. I uh, want to say thank, thank you me. for a great meeting. Thanks for the panelists and uh, yeah, this meeting uh, about emotional sobriety, the first one for me. Uh, I guess uh, uh, I'm what's, uh, what you call a millennial. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm so glad to have found uh, this, uh, this place. I've been in uh, therapy my half my life. And uh, I noticed the em emotional sobriety bit is very helpful to me. I, I, I notice I can now catch myself when I have something like fear of missing out or, or judgment and... Uh, stuff like uh, meetings and actually talking to fellows and going to these Zoom meetings uh, to me is very, uh, has been very helpful. Uh, I'm not a typical alcoholic, I guess, uh, either. Uh, uh, unrelated bit, my mind is going all over the place. I posted like a, a YouTube video on um, boundaries and in interpersonal relationship from a, a, another a Dutch woman dealing with intimacy, intimacy issues. So might be interesting for someone. Um, yeah, I'm not a typical alcoholic in, in the sense that I think uh, uh, dealing with emotions and accepting myself has been like the root cause of my addiction, not the other way around. My addiction did not make me like bad at uh, dealing with emotions. It didn't help me either, but uh, I think 
not being able to deal with emotions and how I feel was like something like a sensitive guy all my life. And uh, yeah, I can imagine uh, uh, women or minorities having problems in traditional AA rooms because it's such um, sometimes a dogmatic experience. And I've been told like, if you don't pray, um, you're not gonna recover uh, or you have to find a higher power for this to work. And uh, yeah, to me, like part of my friends, it's like telling a gay guy to eat pussy or it won't go to heaven or something. It's just not not very, very, it's bullshit. To me, it, it, I think it can be damaging. And uh, as, a, as a millennial, I'm also like wondering what, what I could do to help other young people and older people as well to, you know, find secular recovery or at least recovery that's suitable for them you know if if it's if you have uh, if you want god to recover that's your call and yeah go you if that helps you recover um but i think for many people it's it's like a barrier to actually go into recovery or to go to meetings so uh, i'm also curious what uh, some people would yeah think about what what, what can i do as a millennial to uh, get young people to uh, recovery or something. I think it's uh, very interesting. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Sorry for going all over the place. Uh, thanks. Uh, for having no, me. that was wonderful. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Tune. Judy H. Before you go to Judy, Joe, let me just yeah, say something to Tune real quick. You see, the way I've connected this stuff up, Tune, with this emotional sobriety is when I look back at my drinking and using and in everything that I did, even before then, because, you know, like you, I believe the unmanageability of my life started well before I picked up a drink at 11 years old. Um, you know, I, I think I was heading for trouble early on. I think picking up a drink was just a symptom of, of the trouble I was in. But for me, it all had to do with freedom, with trying to find a solution to deal with all of these emotions that I didn't know how to handle and somehow trying to find a way to be okay in the world. So, you know, in many ways, I've, I've kind of befriended my addiction is really just a misguided psychological adaptation, if you will. But it was a way of trying to figure things out with what was available at the time. Now there's so much more available after being in a program for 49 years, you know, in addition to great people, like I can reach out with Joe and Judy's going to talk next. She, you know, we, we've been colleagues and friends for 46 years, I think now, something like that. And we spent many a days in her home and, and talking about these kinds of things and trying to find our way through all this stuff. But to me, what made sense was when Bill talked about this is the path to emotional freedom. Now it connected something inside of me that I hadn't connected up before is that's what I was always looking for is when I was drinking or when I was high, it didn't matter who I was and what I felt. I was okay, but that was the only time I was okay. It was short lived. I didn't know how to sustain that other by trying to do more and more and more. That's where I got addicted to more. And I kept trying to figure out all these things to do to be free and never realized, you know, what I could do that, you know, we have that saying it's an inside job. I get that. But what does that mean? Right. And now I'm starting to understand what that means. Now I'm now starting I'm to see some of the path to that freedom. Try to follow that, Judy. Okay. <laughs> he can, if anybody can. <laughs> oh, yeah, every day is brand new, baby. Who knows, you know? Uh, anyway, thank you all very much. I, I love, and I've been to all these workshops, and today I had to be setting up for our party later, so I'll have to go back and listen to the tape, but I, but I listened to everything. Just didn't take my notes. Um, I love it because it, these emotional sobriety things, because they're addressing what I think, you know, Ernie Larson called stage two recovery. And, and one of the things I really resent is how they always say, most important person in the room is a newcomer. I don't think so. I'm an old timer and I'm here to show you what it looks like from here and hopefully attract you to want to get over here. Uh, but, uh, you know, listen, I, I did therapy for a living. I sold my soul for therapy, you know, and uh, I don't do it for fun and for free. 
you know what I'm talking. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is it's a selfish program. So I became a therapist to figure out why all these things and it never helped me. And, and these programs have helped me tremendously for the last 46 years, as well as working with Alan and so many wonderful people. But I just want to kind of argue a bit about our tendency to be in this mode of figuring things out. Because I came here very successfully having figured it all out and I stood in front of the refrigerator and explained to you exactly why I was doing this. It didn't ever help me to stop, didn't ever attract me to a new way of life. And, um, you know, I have this sign behind me, enjoy the journey. I hope we can attract you to how fun this is to laugh at yourself and get over yourself, you know. And I had a very, very damaged, violent, terrible childhood, and it went on for at least 60 years. And now I'm in recovery, and it's a different person is showing up. And it's not because of my self-help efforts. It's because of this mutual aid society. And even after 46 years of, of recovery, I still need to call my sponsor. I still need to get talked off the ledge. Uh, in a flash, I can have a reaction from the past. If it's, you know, they say if it's hysterical, it's historical. And, you know, I forgive myself and move on to the next step. But I have learned a little bit of restraint of tongue and pen and a little bit of being more interested in compassion and kindness than my, my former attributes, which were fighter. I was a fighter. I'm writing a book now about giving up the fight and surrender. Uh, cease fighting everything and everyone. And the minute I think I've done that, I'm back in the ring. So, um, you know, like that. Thanks. See you Wednesday, Judy. At yes, your, sir. Uh, New Thanks. York City uh, Brighter's uh, AA workshop. That'll be it's posted in the chat, guys. And Joe is our speaker this Wednesday. Maria the week after. Alan the week after that. Yay! Oh. Come on I, down. I just I wanted to <coughs> interject something about that, Judy. <coughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Maybe I didn't emphasize it enough. One of the things that I find really exciting about the uh, the whole field of interpersonal neurobiology is it emphasizes how much of this is transmitted beneath the level of cognition, beneath the level of language, and how important our interpersonal relations are. And I've come to believe, I used to be one of those people that said, well, the program is the steps, and you got to work the steps, and the fellowship may be nice, but... And I've gone to the opposite end of that now. I think the fellowship is probably one of the most important things about AA or any 12-step program. Um, not because you get all the answers, but because there is this energy and this transmission of information and heart that you, you don't have to figure it out. You don't have to fix it. You don't have to think about it. But you do have to stay sober. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of important. It's, that is the sine qua non of the whole thing. And sobriety means whatever it is that you are needing to stay sober around. Right. Whether it's a process addiction or a substance addiction or whatever it is. I've been addicted in a lot of ways. So <clears throat> I have over 40 years now of not picking up a drink. But <laughs> a lot of other things I did to avoid. Thanks. Thanks. Can I just add on one quick <clears throat> thing there? I was in a Buddhist monastery crying to this monk about, I thought we were supposed to do all this to feel better and to not have pain. And her answer was, you know, the more conscious you become, the more you see the world's pain. It's not lessened. You're so awake and alive. And this fellowship of the spirit is difficult path and I need my fellow travelers to be on this journey with me so I watch how you do and I watch how I do and we kind of slip and slide into the fellowship of the spirit well I love what you said Judy you know you've always been such an iconoclast in so many ways with everything you did even especially what you did for people with eating disorders and but this whole thing about the newcomer isn't the only 
important person in that room or the most important is the truth of it. It's just like you're saying, it's we all need each other. The newcomer reminds us of what it was like, but also the, the person that's got some long-term recovery tells us what it can be like. Oh, yeah. And so that, that we need both those elements. And see, that's one of the things that I think that, you know, I know that you and I discovered on our journey together. Every experience we have can be grist for that mill. Remember, we used to talk about grist for the therapeutic mill. It's all grist for the mill. We don't know how to grind it sometimes. We don't know how to extract the chaff from the wheat, so to speak. But there is that, there is the possibility that if we meet our experiences in a different way, those will grow us no matter what they are. And that's why I love what emotional sobriety says. We can be okay regardless of what's happening. It's an I'm okay, even if things aren't working out the way I want them to. That's the heart of this emotional sobriety. I'm okay, even if instead of I'm okay, if I'm okay, if this stuff goes my way. No, it's about I'm okay, even if. And that's where we start to grow ourselves. Thank you, you, Alan. We've got, uh, let's see, four or five left. If uh, Luann still has her hand up and I'm going to try to get everyone in. Uh, I know we've gone over already, but I'm the bad example of boundaries on this panel. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's get through everyone if we can. Anna. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you. I will try to keep it short. Um, uh, I am an early sobriety and I really related to the stuff about um, interpersonal uh, knowledge and all that stuff and uh, harm to the brain. See, I'm showing it right now. Um, My early sobriety, I am having a hard time putting my thoughts effectively into words. So please um, forgive me if I bungle it. Uh, But um, to achieve emotional sobriety, I really need to address my PTSD and the emotional trauma along with the drinking because they are very, very interrelated. Um, and I'm having a hard time with that. In my backward state of Montana, just getting the PTSD addressed is almost impossible. Um, and the AA meetings and, the, and finding secular sobriety, fortunately, is helping a lot but the, the trauma triggers the cravings. And, you know, there's this relationship between the two that really um, I would like to find a way to address. And I am sure I am not at all alone in that. Um, I know, you know, in some AA meetings, they may call, might call it an outside issue, but um, I, I disagree with that to some degree. Um, I do uh, attend a uh, it's adult children group, a 12 step group is called adult children and narcissists. And they have addressed addiction as an aspect of our experience. And that's great. Um, but I, I would, I'm hoping that maybe in AA there would be, I'm having to read so I can actually follow a coherent train of thought. Um, oh, a fellowship. Yeah. The fellowship. Oh my God. It is so healing. As someone said, um, the fellowship being as important as the steps. And for me, absolutely, the fellowship is keeping me sober and keeping me sane and keeping me committed to my sobriety. It's it's the thing that I really need. And a lot of that is the social healing and the emotional healing that is part of the emotional sobriety. So um, my conclusion is I would like to find some trauma focused groups. And I know there have some been some in the past, but I don't know if they still exist. Um, If there are any, I would love to join one. Thank you for listening. Yeah, if anyone can post something on that, that'd be great. Uh, Cassandra. Hi, everybody. I'm Cassandra. Um, I just wanted to add a little thing. Um, I really love these emotional spready webinars. Um, I, when I, when my whole life, my mom used to tell me to, to not let myself, um, to not like give myself away, not give myself away to, you know, the human world. Don't tell them all my secrets. And I was on a mission to find people who would love me in spite of me. 
um, loved me in spite of all of the things that I had done in my life. And I, and I was going to tell them the worst of the worst to make sure that they were suitable for my friendship. And um, what's the funny thing is when I got to AA, I found those people that actually understand who are, that are okay with who I am and love me anyway for who I am. And one other thing is that when I got to AA, the, that this extreme side of my, my self-will, my um, uh, need to, to do my own thing all the time and be the boss and all this other stuff. I learned there that I learned here that I don't have to do that. And, but I had to learn from going to the other complete other extreme as asking for help and getting help and accepting help and, and, um, being nurtured and being loved. And, um, and that is what, where I've grown the most is by going from one extreme to the next and then finding myself in the middle. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Jeb, please. Jeb. <laughs> uh, thanks, Joe. And thanks all of you for these panels. They've been wonderful. Uh, yeah, my name is Jeb and I'm a grateful recovered addict alcoholic. And uh, emotional sobriety is one of my very favorite topics. And e even though I'm over the hill in a lot of ways, and I'm a retired therapist, I'm still pretty much a traditional 12-stepper. And uh, the, even the topic reminds me of what Bill wrote in the 12 and 12. And, it, it, and I, I say this all the time as a reminder that how important it has been for me. It says, here we be begin to practice all 12 steps of the program in our daily lives so that we and those about us can find emotional sobriety. I didn't take that seriously until my partner committed suicide 37 years ago and realized that he was doing this shit that I hear all the time in these toxic meetings I was attending of living in the, in the maintenance steps that comes out of the red, little red book. And that infuriated me. And so that's when I took it seriously and have tried to, to uh, find my practice of, of the process of um, a priority. And uh, you, you reminded me also, one of the things that really influenced me was Ken Wilber's book on no boundaries and realizing that I had the right. That's why I call my, my higher, no, yeah, my higher self or the greater self, inner wisdom, love, compassion, and protection. Because by establishing the boundaries, I realize I have control over who can violate them, come through or not. And that was an essential part of my recovery. And, uh, you know, the, so many t things came out of it for me. Um, I could not be the person I am today if I hadn't continued to develop that sane and sound ideal for my future relationships because every inventory showed me that my major problems are something else that Bill talked about in the 12 and 12, and that is defective relationships being the root of so many problems, including my alcoholism. And uh, uh, I guess I, I want to, oh, the other, the other thing that I realized that in person to person, meetings and so forth, I realized that the oxytocin level is stimulated. I have not experienced that in virtual meetings. And just recognizing that today, I'm tempted just to go to <laughs> or get, get, get some in-person brick, uh, brick and mortar meetings going here in Denver because uh, I miss that, I guess. Jim, and, three uh, minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just appreciate what we're doing here so much. And I look forward to the next series. Thanks so much, Jeb. Thank you. Uh, Luanna. Hi, my name is Luanne and I'm a grateful alcoholic. I'm so glad my friend turned me on to this. Um, so many things stuck out and I'll try to keep this short, but uh, Maria, when you said don't depend on other people. Stand on your own two feet. I, uh, I've had 39 surgeries and I have radiation poisoning and I'm mostly in bed. But I decided after talking to my mother 
to buy a treadmill. And I, it's kind of emotional. And there's some days I can do it. And there's some days that I can't. And I spend a lot of time in bed, which triggers pause before reacting because I have a loving boyfriend who takes care of me. But who do I take my frustration and my disability out on? This helped me so much. Um, the other thing was um, the ostrich in the sand, the parrot repeating Pat saying, which is why I'm so glad I'm here because I, I love AA, just like Anna said. But there are so many, can I just say this, deacons that say the same thing over and over and over and don't, from, in my opinion, and I'm going to be very honest here, I had 28 years. I went out for a year, and I've now got almost six years. The wisdom that I have gained, because my sponsor tells me to celebrate 50 years, you didn't, you, you lost the years, but you did not lose the wisdom. The wisdom that I have gained in this last six years far outweighs my first 28 years. I just want to thank everybody, the emotional sobriety, and I'm very emotional <laughs> because I'm going to try more to stand on my own feet and not get discouraged when I have to spend days in bed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for posting. Uh, Kenji, a final thought? Uh, sure. I put my hand back down, I, um, but, but sure. Um, my name is Kenji. I'm an addict alcoholic, and um, and this has been really good. Um, I just wanted to kind of bounce off. This might be slightly off topic, but off what Joe said about we're kind of on millennials' platforms now and Gen Zs, and um, and and also uh, what John said about um, that fellowship is is a thing. I find myself far more enthralled and enmeshed in AA on in secular AA on Zoom than I ever felt over almost 40 years in in brick and mortar rooms. And I don't know exactly why that is. Um, and um, here in San Francisco, AA trends kind of young, I would say. I mean, often I find myself and it's very strong. I mean, it's a bit AA is thriving in the Bay Area. And um, and um, and often I find myself one of the, if not the oldest person in the room. And interestingly, in secular AA and Zoom, that's not the case. Um, the demographic trends much older, and and there's also a lot of people with a lot of time. I've been around for, for almost forty years, but I'm but I but I'm in in my first year of recovery after a relapse. So um, um, and I think that's just really interesting, and I don't know exactly why that is. Where the and also the thing about AA in San Francisco is that all these young people that are totally into AA are also mostly totally thumpers, also, and um, um, not so much. I mean, it's not Bible Belt country, so it's it's not you know it's they're not you know preaching from the pulpit, but it's but they're definitely preaching with a big book in their hands, and um, and I'm not um, and I think that's okay, um, but it's. Um, I find it so interesting that it's entirely different here and entirely different. I don't know. I don't, I don't quite see why none of them are here too, but anyway, um, just, just those random off topic thoughts. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Let's see here. Just a couple of closing uh, comments to sort of uh, whiz through here and uh, feedback. Take a screenshot. <laughs> We'd love it's to also hear from in the you. chat. It it's also in the chat. chat. Fantastic. Um, uh, yeah, contra yeah, that's also in the chat. And uh, thanks uh, for letting me do this. Thanks, everybody, for help, especially behind the scenes. Mark, uh, John S., who's not here today, but he's been very helpful on Cat Little Creek, uh, Cat L. Uh, thank you very much. Um, 
maybe you can edit that out for me. Uh, <laughs> starting in June, uh, the uh, Free Thinkers Living Sober uh, is starting varieties of sober experience. Uh, there will be plenty more on that very soon. So stay close to social media. Uh, there's a Zoom ID if you want to capture that. It's the same time zone as this one. It'll be uh, the last uh, Sunday of every month. And uh, here's some more contacts and links. And uh, here is how to reach any of the panelists and speakers. Uh, we would all love to hear from you, really. Just, just call us. We're, uh, we're home that day. And uh, thanks, everybody, especially the participants, for a fantastic uh, five sessions. It has been just a thrill to be part of. I think it's uh, just great. End of slideshow. Uh, thank you, uh, Alan, for lending your platform. And I know you've got to use this uh, site for something that should have started three minutes ago. And uh, so uh, we'll probably Joe, be uh, logging uh, off very quickly, but hope to see you all <laughs> online soon. Joe, I, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, if you don't mind, um, on behalf of the Free Thinkers Living Sober group, I really want to thank everybody for being here. And especially, you know, I didn't know Maria, I didn't know Alan. I knew Joe a little bit because he's kind of part of our group. But um, I just, you know, we just picked up an email and said, hey, you want to do this? And I'm really grateful you did. The group is very happy with all of this. And, and I hope it's been beneficial to many people. And thank you again, Maria and Alan and Joe for participating. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, John. And I, I'm so glad that we got to be a part of Bill's dream. Yeah. He was hoping back in 1956 when he was writing that letter to somebody out in California that somehow emotional sobriety would spearhead the next movement. And it didn't happen, I think, for a lot of reasons. I think the spiritual bypass that you talked about, John, I think we relied on sticking things in the God box and not really doing this work. And uh, the God box didn't work. It's a wonderful idea, but it didn't work. And now here we are. And I think that all of you have contributed to this being part of the spearhead of the next this, this movement. And I think it's really going to make a world of difference for so many people that are out there struggling. So I really appreciate each and every one of you for your contribution to that. Thanks all. Appreciate your time. Good to see you all. Thank you all. Thanks so much, everyone. Until next time. See you guys time. on Thursday. So Come do we do we do a closing prayer or are we supposed